What's that? Advanced manually. Yeah, um, you won't. Um, it's just this weird thing that it does when we're hooked up to this. You have to unplug it and then plug it back in. Or it only knows, yeah. So then, what's that? It goes to sleep. Yes, it does. So we are broadcasting right now. Just put that on if you want. Be high up. You use that, so the only thing is if you're on the slide for a long time, I'm going to use it. So just all press all the little buttons in your hand. Thank you everyone so much for coming out on this cold and snowy day, although I heard it's going to get worse on Friday. <laughs> yeah. Everybody, please be careful. Um, I'm Heidi Brennigan, I'm the Chief Marketing Officer here at ERC. Just some housekeeping details. First and foremost, um, silence your phones, please. If you have them on you, bathrooms are out here and on the right. Um, 
Many of you hopefully already know Dr. Elizabeth Grind. She is um, one of our board certified veterinarians. I just said one was Dr. Gary Sin earlier. And um, they make up our um, oral uh, dentistry and oral surgery team. Um, and she's been here since 2013, we decided. Yeah, coming up on seven years. And um, I know she has a lot of really great information um, to share with you today. We're also um, doing online webinar today, so that is an option in case you weren't aware. Um, you now have the option to attend these online from the comfort of your office. So in the future, if it's very snowy and you would prefer to stay at your office, um, you can log in and do that there. Um, so we're really excited to be able to offer that and serve that many more people with our students. Um, please make sure you sign in if you didn't. I do need that signature and verify that the email that you have to is correct because I will email you um, Dr. Bryant's proceedings as well as your CE certificate after the presentation. Expect it in about seven days. I'm usually um, pretty good about that and usually it's faster. So if you didn't get it, let me know because sometimes the AARCMN.com email doesn't play well with other um, servers. I've noticed that um, their Earthlink in particular, who has an Earthlink in that. So definitely reach out to me and we'll send it to you um, via another way to make sure that you get that. We'll turn over to you, Dr. Brian. Thanks, Heidi. Uh, welcome, and I'm really excited to see everyone today. And we have about as many people on our webinar. So it's really exciting that we can serve this many people here today. <laughs> Um, so as we get started, I want to ask each of you personally to think about three things as we go through this little hour long meeting here today. Three things to note that either you just want to do it back at your clinic or note to yourself or bring back to your team. Um, some may be big, some might be little, um, but we'll kind of review at the end. But just again, just a to-do list of three things is, is what I'm asking. And I know this, this seminar is, is less common dental uh, cases, and you know, again, we, we see a lot during our, our practices during the day, but you have the skills to see these unusual cases, because 85% of dentistry, you, you already have this capability. We do the same thing at, at our service downstairs, but complete oral exam and charting, full mouth dental radiographs, dental cleaning, nerve blocks, extraction, and biopsy. So we're gonna delve a little deeper into some of these subjects. But again, we do some advanced things here, but you have the skills, hopefully, um, but we can help you too. And, and we're here to act, uh, help answer your questions, review things, but you have, you have the skills already to see these cases and to work through them. So a little public service announcement, just to start, about oral charting. It's a four-handed procedure, and what that means is the technician who is, or the person, I should say, maybe the doctor or the technician who is inspecting the mouth is gonna dictate that information to someone on a dental chart. That really is the most efficient way to do it um, so that you're not spending a lot of time. So again, four-handed, two people working together, one telling the other what they're, what they're seeing. It may be electronic, and we'll talk a little bit about electronic versions. We currently use a paper version, I think probably many of you do too. And the oral chart, the dental chart, should have some symbols or codes or abbreviations with the key. Again, this, we want to make this easy so you can quickly visualize what's happening in the mouth so that it can be communicated between your staff members and also for referral. And um, there are some abbreviations we'll talk about, but have a discussion in your clinic and decide how you wanna do it as a team. So it's consistent, everyone understands what's expected, and the routine is worked through the same way. It just makes for a more efficient way of doing the, the oral exam. Include photos and diagrams. And again, a lot of the oral charts, the dental charts include a diagram, which makes it much easier to note exactly where it is that you're seeing this thing. But everyone has a phone usually, and so taking photographs can really help too, especially again, if you're communicating with your owners, you're gonna communicate with your team members. If you're interested in doing referral, it really, really helps a lot. What, what we do at our, in our service here is I really recommend having a dental chart for what you find, the exam, and a dental chart for what you do, the treatment. There's a lot going on in the mouth. In the dog, we've got 42 patients. 
42 teeth in the cat we've got 30 patients so it can get really jammed if you're trying to include everything on one piece of paper so that might be something to consider is separating them out again to make it easy to visualize what we found as compared to what we did and remember this is part of the permanent record so uh, if you've ever uh, sent a referral to us and we've sent you back the uh, the case and the record. It'll include some written description, but we are not going to repeat. You do not need to do in longhand your findings necessarily. The, the diagram um, is what, what will be sufficient along with the pictures. So again, you don't need to rewrite them. I, I don't recommend that at all. And I'm a very visual person, so I want to be able to look quickly where I see a lot of ink, because that's going to clue me in. And what's important about the dental chart especially is that you're going to use this along with looking at your radiographs and look at them together to get an idea of what's happening in the mouth. Some abbreviations that are already available for you is through the American Veterinary Dental College. And this is just a screenshot. Um, if you uh, click on the ribbon for the primary care practice resources or the technician resources, there's a link that already has it in a PDF of all the abbreviations. Now these abbreviations are above and beyond to the 10th degree of what you need in general practice. But again, it, it's just a good starting point to kind of sit, sit down and go, what do we use in our general practice? What's gonna, what, what's gonna be helpful? And again, if you're already using the abbreviations used by the college, you're gonna understand um, the communication too. But again, if there's unusual codes or different colors of ink or whatever you use, make sure there's a key so anyone looking at that chart is gonna understand what it is you're indicating. This is our canine dental exam chart um, and it's probably familiar, if, again, if you've seen our, the cases that we have sent back to you. Um, and it's essentially an Excel spreadsheet that has a diagram attached. And so if anyone is interested in getting a copy of this that could be used, it'd be without our logo on it. And if you want to use it in your own practice, um, indicate either by email or on your um, registration, or if you're on the webinar, let us know through the dental service. And we'll, se we'll send you a copy along with your certificate and the notes today. Especially though, you, on, on the charting, you want to note what the periodontal pocket depth is. Not the sulcus, which is normal, but what is beyond normal? Again, that is what's really important. And you have 30 patients in the cat's mouth and 42 patients in the dog mouth. You are not going to remember by the time you get to the next case. And you're certainly not going to remember by the time you see them in six months or a year later. And you in general practice, you're the ones that see the yearly cases. And so it's, I, I would say it's, it's, it's very important for all of us, but especially you in general practice, to keep track of what, what's happening. Are we on top of the home care? Are we keeping the mouth healthy? Are we starting to see some inflammation and tissue loss? So in our particular chart, we have the top, the top two lines, um, have buccal and um, palatal. And if you look on the lower, we've also got buccal and lingual, and that's where you can indicate Attachment loss is also indicated in measurement. And again, using your periodontal probe, are you getting loss of attachment tissues that may be gingival recession or may actually be alveolar bone loss? And so you're looking from the, where the crown is from the cemental enamel junction to, to where it probes to, and that is loss of attachment. So again, just to kind of review periodontal probing, um, the picture on the, <clears throat> on the left shows a periodontal probe and then it's being inserted into the middle part. So when we indicate on our chart, we're actually doing three measurements, a mesial or in the, front, the cranial part of the tooth, midline as being shown here, and distal. So you'll see three numbers. Again, only mark if it's abnormal. If it's zero or normal, if it's blank, that's great. Again, I, I look at my chart to look for ink. So if it's normal, there's no reason to indicate it. And then of course you also need to check palatally or lingually on the inside of the tooth too. So in our service, we do everything in, in um, lateral. Um, so we're, we're evaluating all the upsides of the teeth. So again, and, and as you take a look here, as, as you look, note on the chart, and we're gonna go through some cases that actually have chart notations. 
from midline is the mesial to the middle to the distal. And we just keep going from midline back. And so those numbers are in that order from midline on the chart towards the back. So furcation is also something to indicate on multi-rooted teeth. F1 or um, on, the, on, on this line uh, for the furcation, it would just be one, two, or three. One is you can start to see the furcation. So it means you probably already have some gingival recession to see the furcation. F2 or furcation two is gonna be, you can start to get that probe in. And three is a through and through. And we have all seen them where you have the tooth and that, that periodontal probe goes all the way through. Again, it's really important to note. <clears throat> and then mobility. So again, if it's got some um, slight movement is M1, uh, less than a millimeter would be M2 greater than a millimeter in um, mobility is gonna be M3. And then gingival index, which we do not currently have on our chart. And the reason is, is because again, we're seeing cases that are being referred to us, but I think this is a very important thing to indicate if you're in general practice and you're seeing these cases back on a timely basis. Because the gingival index is gonna, is gonna really tell you what's happening with the periodontal health. So let's dive into that a little bit. A G1 would be some color change, usually again to that gingival edge of the, of the attached gingiva, but no bleeding when you probe. G2 is gonna be moderate inflammations and it bleeds on probing. And G3 would be severe inflammation if it's bleeding spontaneously. Because remember, when we look at periodontal disease, we, there's a big difference in reversible and irreversible. We have normal gingiva, and we start to have some gingivitis, just inflammation of the gingiva, that's gonna be in our G1, that is still reversible. We can still turn that around. By the time we are starting to see loss, attachment loss, so by the time we already see gingival recession or attachment loss, we have already lost tissue. We will never get that back, never get that back. We can hope to stop it, but we'll never get it back. And, and in, in human dentistry, millimeters are huge and people have to water pick and be on um, medications and see their dentist every three months. So again, if we're seeing, um, we're seeing these different uh, changes to the gingiva, it's really important. So I, again, I think in private practice, you will pick up early changes to help these owners get on home care and reevaluate quickly. So again, that's, <clears throat> those are the big things that we currently have on the dental chart. And then also we have some reminders too. Uh, down in the lower right hand, we have some reminders for ourselves to do some extra oral. Uh, look at the lymph nodes, the tongue, the buccal mucosa, the palate. And these are usually things that we run through, especially if we're waiting for a nerve block to take effect or we're waiting for the animal to get deep enough that we can put our expensive dental pro our, uh, Radi uh, radiology probe in there, a sensor to take radiographs. So again, <clears throat> think of this as prompts to remind you to go through and do a consistent uh, dental oral examination. This is our cat chart. So again, a little different because cats have less teeth, um, <clears throat> but very similar. So you don't need to copy what we have, but you, you do need to chart what's happening in the mouth. And there are some electronic versions too. And again, this will be in the resources and the notes. Um, Dr. David Clark has this electronic version. It looks very nice. I have no, no affiliation other than he's, a, he's also a, a diplomate in the college. So it's something to consider. Again, um, it has some very nice features. If you wanna know more about dental charting, our uh, two wonderful technicians, Heidi and Laurel, are going to be doing next month a, home, uh, more of a oral exam and uh, charting more in depth. So please have your staff, both veterinarians and technicians, come to that. So let's go through some cases, okay? Mav is a domestic medium hair cat, male neutered, 15 months of age, so pretty young. And remember that, he's, he's a young cat. Owners came in because they noticed that he had pretty stinky breath. Really, really smelled horrible. But on physical exam, pretty much um, no significant findings except for on oral exam. 
we did find some gingival inflammation and some gingival enlargement. Again, gingival enlargement because we don't know what it is to say um, hyperplastic gingiva is actually if you biopsy and have that, have that as a diagnosis. So, And on his pre-op lab work, CBC and chemistry, no abnormal findings. What do you want to do next? Remember this, the skills that you have. We need to examine all 30 of those patients in his mouth. And as even for the most compliant patient, the most cooperative animal, there's no way we can probe and examine and look under the gum line without anesthesia. So an anesthetized oral exam and charting. We want to take full mouth x-rays. What's going on? The studies have shown, even in teeth that look normal, we have about 50% chance of finding something unexpected. Dental cleaning while they're here. So again, honestly, dental cleaning is kind of like, a, oh, let's do this because we're already anesthetized. That's really usually not the main part of why, why we're seeing these cases. Maybe some nerve blocks, maybe a biopsy. And this is what this guy looked like. Pretty inflamed. Um, and again, I, I, we tend not to take photos while they're awake. It's really hard when you have a moving target in the room and the owners, I'll take a peek and then we'll, we'll take a look at sample pictures and use a, a model, but it's pretty rare that we will take a photo of a awake animal. They're almost all anesthetized. And again, I, looking at him, I, I see he's got some staining on his canine teeth on the enamel. Um, the photo to the right, very, very inflamed gingiva of the attached gingiva. And this is actually then his dental chart. So again, when we look at these and we see the three numbers from midline, which is that solid line on the oral exam, that um, number one, one, one would mean from mesial, middle, and distal, we, we're getting a one millimeter um, probing. One is, is um, again, in a cat, probably normal, but in some of his other readings, we're seeing some other numbers. And again, on our chart, we will circle a code and then indicate where it is we're seeing it. So again, I have the luxury in that. I'm in the room with my technician. We work through the whole case together. I know it's not the case when you're in private practice. When I was in private practice, you're seeing appointments. Someone, you know, they're back doing the dental procedures. You're checking in and out. So again, make it easy on yourself so you can quickly check in, see what's going on. And then you're going to use this chart when you're evaluating the dental x-rays too. So let's look a little more carefully at the x-rays in comparison to what we have on our dental chart. So here we're looking at the right maxilla. And so this is the area we're going to look at on his dental chart. And again, he's a young animal because I see a wide pulp space in the canine tooth. Um, when I look a little further back, again, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to compare where do I see a lot of ink on the dental chart as compared to what's going on on the, on the x-ray. And <clears throat> again, some um, on the maxilla, some, some uh, periodontal pockets, but not, not too bad. And looking at x-ray, probably a little bit of increased space of his first molar of his periodontal ligament space. So let's look now at the mandible. Again, wide pulp space would be expected for a young animal. He's got some periodontal pockets, but some recession along the canine tooth. And again, we're measuring from the point of the cemental enamel joint um, junction to where we see the, where we see the bone. And, and yeah, we have, we have some loss along there. What's also noted though, is that when I look back at the 409, the first molar, and again, the, the problem with x-rays is that we're looking at a 3D object with a, with a 2D picture. And also, when we look at x-rays, for things to change, you have to have a change of 30 to 50% of your calcification to be able to see that change on radiographs. So radiographs are always a little bit behind the clinical picture. So again, look at your chart, 
to see. And when I do look, I do see that there is a difference in the height of the alveolus in that distal root. I can see two different heights. One, again, one looks more at the cemental enamel junction, but the other one is lower. And that's again, because you're looking at both the lingual side and the buccal side. So he definitely does have some, have some loss there. Again, we'll look at the other side. And, and as we go through cases, this will go a little faster. We aren't gonna go through quite, quite so slowly. But again, this is just so you know the, the process of how we walk through these cases in comparing the chart to the dental x-rays. So on the other side though, I'm seeing uh, more, uh, some mobility and definitely some pockets around that little nugget of that 209, which is just a little tiny tooth. Um, and I can really see that on the x-ray, it looks like there's some, some widening of the periodontal ligament space. Again, it also shows on our dental chart, just some reminders again of going through the extra oral lymph nodes and especially on cats, Something to add to your chart would be to check the synthesis. Check that he's got a few synthesis. Be sure you check that before you've done extractions. Now we're gonna look at the mandible. And again, these are the areas that we're looking at. And again, on this 309, I'm getting progressively um, bigger periodontal pocketing. And remember, when you have recession, so that's also on top of it. So if I have a periodontal pocket of one plus a two millimeter recession, we already have three millimeters of loss. We're never gonna get that back. We can hope to stop it. A lot of times though, by stopping it, maybe extraction. So what do you wanna do next? We're gonna do some nerve blocks. We're gonna com complete the dental cleaning and polishing. Extract the diseased teeth. Again, we're never getting that tissue back. So even while we're waiting for the biopsy, don't leave, don't leave teeth that already have disease in there. So no matter what the diagnosis comes back as biopsy, um, again, we'll, ne we'll never get that attachment of that bone or the gingiva. And biopsy the gingiva, I would recommend it. Do we have to? And we'll talk about more about what this case is. Maybe not. We need to do some pain control because inflammation is painful. And I want my owners to start daily home dental care. We need to start controlling plaque in this guy. He's young, remember he's 15 months old. And that's what we did. We took many different biopsies and I've indicated with the BI where we did the incisional biopsies. We extracted 209 and both the lower first molars. It came back as periodontitis, juvenile stomatitis. This is actually something we see quite a bit and we get a lot of referrals for. Very young cats, usually less than three years of age. So again, we need to make sure pain control, that how, are, how are things going, check back in with the owners, come in with their materials, demonstrate, we demonstrate, we, show, we have them show us how they're doing it. And then we wanna repeat professional cleaning every three to four months. It's, we need to really get on it. So sometimes you'll see these cases that come in that are very inflamed, again, very young cats. They have terrible, terrible mouths. Um, and if it's gone on long enough, the inflammation is probably caused already again, some bone loss or gingival recession. This is a little bit more mild case, but you can really see the difference that with daily home dental care, you can really turn these guys around. It looks pretty normal. So what is juvenile periodontitis or juvenile stomatitis? They're very young cats, so they're usually less than three years of age. Sometimes they're closer to a year. My impression is that purebreds are more prone. Um, and we think right now, current research, that we think it's because they have an immature immune system. And again, the cat, cats react to everything, don't they? Just out in the environment. But in the, in the mouth, some of these cats are reacting to the plaque. So we need to get them pain-free and start daily home plaque control, brushing or wiping, and professional cleanings. This is not the case where you see them once and then you see them a year later. You need to check back in with them. Do these cats turn into feline chronic gingival stomatitis? I don't think so. Because when do we see those cases? Those cases are eight or nine-year-old cats. These cats would, again, their breath is so bad. 
people would, would not get to that. Is there a population that may turn into those? That, that could be. But at this point, more studies and research are needed. But again, if you see these very young cats, less than three years of age, get them in, get them started. You, again, you may not biopsy, um, but get them started on home care and pain control. And that's one thing that I have the owners start to look at is if their cat is starting to resist having the teeth brushed, it's time to get them back in. So it's usually at about three months. The most important part of what you're doing professionally, honestly, is the polishing. But if you do find a tooth that when you're probing, we've already got lost now, you know, three or six months later, extract that tooth. You're, you're not going to get the tissue back. Any questions about math? And we'll take uh, online, we'll have questions at the end too for you to type in. So the next case we're going to talk about is George. George is a very cool cat. He's a domestic short hair, male neutered. He's a good middle-aged cat, 13 years old. The owners notice something in the mouth. And as we know, that's really unusual for the owners to notice something. We find it on yearly exam. Maybe, maybe. sometimes we don't because cats are cats. Um, on physical exam, he did have a heart murmur, a grade two out of six. On a wake oral exam, he did have a mass at his lower left first molar, way in the back of the mouth. Chemistry and CBC, no abnormal findings. And so what do you want to do next? We got to check out those 30 patients in, in George's mouth. Anesthetized oral exam and charting. Full mouth x-rays, dental cleaning, because we're there anyway, nerve blocks, and biopsy. And maybe extractions, depending on what, what the chart and the um, x-rays look like. And gold star to the RDVM, that's what they did. They did all these things. They are a rock star. But then the mask came back and they sent them to us. So yeah, this looks pretty scary in the mouth. You know, I'm thinking, oh, poor George. Poor George. Because what is the most common oral tumor in the cat's mouth? Yeah, squamous cell carcinoma, squamous cell carcinoma, squamous cell carcinoma. Yeah, really scary. And it's a, it's a sad disease because um, usually on average, the time of survival from diagnosis is only about 45 days. So I was feeling sad for this owner. This is the chart that we found, that we, that we did. And again, looking at, when we look at um, 104, and again, the 555, it's five mesial, five middle, five distal. Recession was at the distal aspect. And it doesn't really show on the chart. It was difficult to see in the, in the clinical pictures too. Um, it looked like it was at the commissure, but it actually was closer to the already extracted uh, 309 or the lower left first molar, which the referring veterinarian had extracted along with taking the biopsy. But wow, it looks pretty good there. It looks like a nice healed extraction site. So we took off the mass again and sent it in. The original histopath came back as inflammatory. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit about biopsy, which is sort of like, mm, ah, okay. But the second histopath, to confirm, came back as a pyogenic granuloma. Yay for George. <laughs> yeah. And what, what did we do next? We extracted the upper left fourth premolar. That, again, as uh, with the occlusion, that's what articulates with the lower first molar. So let's talk about what is a pyogenic granuloma. It's a benign solitary nodule. It's raised, friable, easily hemorrhagic, it resembles granulation tissue, but it also mimics squamous cell carcinoma in appearance. Squamous cell carcinoma is the great masquerader. Squamous cell carcinoma looks like anything. It could look like, wow, these teeth came out easier than I expected them to. It could be, oh, I have an extraction site in a cat that hasn't healed and, and everything went well. So it can present as anything. So I, I, was, I, had been, I had been scared for George. But a pyogenic granuloma is ca commonly caused by some type of trauma of malocclusion. And a, most commonly we see it where the upper fourth premolar is contacting 
the buccal aspect of the lower molar area. But this can be a really hard thing to identify early because it's a cat, right? Cats don't show us much. Cats, you know, they can have terrible things going on and they're gonna act normal. It's way back in the mouth and cats just don't like, you know, they don't like to open their mouth, especially if they come in the car, in the, in the carrier and come to see us. But this is an early clinical photo. And there, another reason why it's hard to find too is, again, by the time we anesthetize them, and we have intubated them, we already have blocked their occlusion, so we can't close their mouth all the way. So this is one of those things where, again, try to check a cat when you're in that phase of you're, you've given them induction drugs and you haven't intubated them yet. Take a look at an occlusion. Again, do we do it every time? No, but if there is something going on in that area, check the occlusion. Because once that cat has an uh, intertracheal tube in, it's gonna be really, you aren't gonna be able to close them off, you won't be able to see that it is the upper fourth premolar articulating. So again, but a lot of times we do see that type of like, oh, there's a swollen area near M1. The weird, we don't know why this happens. The weird thing is, is did this cat have this malocclusion all through life? No, he didn't, you know, he, but yet something started it, something started the inflammation, and then he, and then he got this mass. This is another, again, an earlier version but it can be really hard to see when it's at this point. A lot of times we see it like this, okay? But this, this is scary, because what, what is it? This paper is getting a little old, it's from 2014, but the biggest thing that it found is that biopsy is key. Don't look at that ugly mass, declare that it's squamous cell carcinoma, and have the cat euthanize biopsy it. And I want you to note the second person on the, uh, of the list of authors, Cindy Bell. Uh, she's a pathologist, and we're going to talk about her in just a few minutes. But um, this is a really nice paper. And again, I'll, I'll have this reference in your, in your notes for you. And what they found is for treatment, remove the mass and get it biopsy. We need to find out. So again, squamous cell is still going to be high up on your list. Um, but then removal of the inciting cause, and again, it's that upper fourth premolar with lower M1, scaling and polishing the teeth, and check for recurrence. But of course, this paper had eight cats, so more studies are needed. But in George's case, I had talked to George, his owner, and I'm just like, oh, okay. But I was really thrilled when it came back as a pathogenic granuloma. <laughs> a little aside, another public service announcement where to send your biopsies. And the reason I wanna talk about this is the mouth is a weird place. It's hard to look at, it's hard to find, but tumors behave differently in the mouth than they do in other parts of the body. And so you wanna find a pathologist that's gonna look at everything. Because inflammatory, tooth origin, benign and cancerous masses can all look very similar. The mouth can only react in so many ways. In fact, sometimes cancer looks like inflammation, and sometimes inflammation looks huge and, 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 and very big tissue. So again, your eyes are not a microscope. Classifications change. Not recently, um, but if you have a pathologist that's, that's sending you a reference that's over 30 years old, they, they need to get with a program, because it, it, things do change as far as how things are classified. You want someone to look at the clinical picture too. Is it's been slow growing, has been going on a while. Did we remove a mass last year and it's back in the same area? Did this, did I, did I biopsy this and now it's come back really angry? That, that is important to look at the clinical picture. And you want someone that's gonna review the whole case, dental x-rays, clinical photos, and even the CT. And again, current references are key. So, I highly recommend sending things to the specialty oral pathology for animals. Dr. Cindy Bell, who is the second author on that, um, on that paper, she used to be at Wisconsin, then was at Kansas, now she set up her own um, pathology of only oral. She doesn't do ClinPath, um, she is excellent. And again, I have no financial bearing, but I have to say, we get a lot of cases from referring veterinarians that the biopsies either come back either very favorable or very poor, but it doesn't match the clinical picture. And when we re-biopsy and send it to Dr. Bell's lab, 
we, we get the true diagnosis. Sometimes it's very good news, sometimes it's very poor news. So her lab may be a little more expensive as compared to other labs, and I'm not gonna mention names. One has recently bought up another, but, <laughs> <laughs> but as far as oral tissue, you cannot go wrong with Dr. Bell's lab. Um, she, is, she is the best. So um, again, if you, if you have things that aren't making sense, I would highly recommend checking, checking out SOPA. Okay, let's go with the third case. Maggie is a yellow lab, female spay. She's about six years of age. And she came in to her veterinarian for a yearly physical exam. Everything looked great. Um, and it's like, okay, but she's never had her teeth clean. Let's, let's get her in. Lab work looked wonderful. And yay, yeah, well, you know, what's, but of course, this is a yellow lab. Yellow lab will be happy, wag their tail, and eat until the day they die. But this, this looks scary. What do you want to do next? Yeah. We want to look at those 42 patients, mass size oral exam and charting, full mouth x-rays, dental cleaning, because we're there anyway, nerve blocks, we want a biopsy, extractions. I say for this one though, we, we ended up not, the RDVM did biopsy, but I'm gonna show you, this is, this is actually a, a fairly common thing if we take a look at the rest of the, at the rest of the mouth. So that mass kind of scared the RDVM, sent Maggie to us, and we took a look at everything, but she's got other areas that also have destruction of teeth. So let's look at some photos. So yeah, this is the upper right, the first and second molar, a lot of destruction to these teeth. And that's what those x-rays look like. Yeah, the whole middle of that tooth is gone. But it's eat you notice though, it's really eaten through the tooth and not through the bone. Hmm, she's got something going on on her mandible too, right below these, right below these teeth that are affected. So lower M1 also has this destructive lesion going on. <laughs> And that's what the x-ray looks like. Not, not as much tooth destruction, nearly at all. But I do see how close that lesion is to the pulp horn, the in, inner pulp space. It's really, really close. And when I look, take another x-ray to look at the apices of the tooth roots, I'm starting to see some widening. So we, 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 even though it doesn't look like there's much destruction, we've already entered into the pulp. So we have now endodontic disease in this tooth. But let's take a look at the left side. Hmm, there's a, there's a spot that's kind of sticky. And this is something that you may find in dogs and that there's a dark area, it may be a little bit sticky. But, it, but this is an early lesion of the same thing that's happening on the right side. So this x-ray looks, looks okay. However, again, we all want eyes like Dr. Feeney. And, and, and look at it, but I, I think of x-rays like, first do a squint test, and a squint test is, say, if you put up a Christmas tree, and you put on your li all the lights on, and you squint at it to see, did I kind of put it on uniformly? So if you do a squint test, and again, we've got, a, got an x-ray in a PowerPoint projected onto a screen in a lighted room, it may be harder to see, but I'm gonna put up a normal. And I see a difference in the density of the dentin in the middle of that tooth. And I see a difference in, in the periodontal ligament space. This normal one that has the dark frame around it has a nice sharp dark line of that periodontal ligament space. But on Maggie's tooth, I see some widening, I see some difference. So we also have, we have a lot of destruction happening in, on that tooth. Again, here are some other examples. Again, an early one on the left. A deeper one on the right, a dog that has both more destructive and, and an earlier lesion of a destructive mechanism. This is caries. This is cavities. This is what we get as children or used to get uh, before fluoride. And it's uncommon, but we do, we do see it quite a bit. But um, I think because of fluoride in the water and because of several factors, we don't see it a lot in dogs. But it is something that, again, I think... Gold retrievers and Labradors are overrepresented as far as getting caries. 
So, but but take a look and, and look for the, for this type of um, uncommon dental disease. It's actual decay of the tooth structure. And it's because of acid and fermentation of the carbohydrates having to do with both diet and um, where, where it's located. The occlusal surfaces of molars. So why is it that dogs don't get it like children or that we have to worry about it in children? Well, children, your dentist hopefully does some type of pit and fissure, rest, uh, restoration or sealant early on. Um, kids don't hopefully nearly eat as much candy or pop. But in dogs, dogs have a more alkaline saliva than, than humans do, so it's gonna be less likely. Hopefully they're not eating candy and pop and things like that. A little aside though, um, pot belly pigs, if they eat junk food, get this, because their teeth are shaped more like ours. They're very block-like. And pigs, pot belly pigs, um, will get carious if they are on a poor diet. Pigs are used in studies to mimic human tooth disease because of the tooth shape. Most dog teeth are very conical. Again, it's gonna shed it. But the teeth that we see that mimic our teeth that have that kind of block-like structure are the upper molars and the distal aspect of the lower first molar, second and third molar. So that, that's where we see it and that's where it happened in, in Maggie. What's the treatment? So again, if you're seeing an early lesion, and it's enamel only, it could be restored. This is an advanced procedure we would wanna, we, we want the referral. But again, to know this and to talk to your clients about this is really helpful. What needs to be done after it's restored is it needs to be followed, and it needs to be followed radiographically because we can't rely on the owner, we can't rely on the dog to tell us, and also if we wait for a swollen face, well, something's been going on for a long time. So follow-up is yearly radiographic, evaluation. But a lot of times these are tip of the iceberg and that the point where it's affecting the enamel, underneath it is a larger destruction of the underlying dentin. So a lot of times it is the enamel and the occlusal dentin that is exposed. And that needs root canal therapy and the restoration. And yearly radiographic follow-up. So a lot of times owners again will wrap that into a yearly dental cleaning and have x-rays. And that's something too, the follow-up could be done at your clinic with your dental x-rays or surgical extraction. So if owners, if the tooth is too destroyed and there's not enough tooth structure, oops, sorry, I'm gonna go back. Um, they don't wanna do the follow-up or again, they just wanna have a one and done. Even for these early lesions, extraction is a, is a good option. To leave it is to allow the disease to progress and get worse. So we do see some where that will come in thinking it's enamel only. And again, you, it really can't be evaluated x-ray to see if, because again, the way the x-ray is um, uh, positioned, it's when we start to remove the enamel and we examine the dentin underneath, that's when a lot of times like, ah, we're gonna be doing a root canal if you wanna save this tooth. And when we, you know, I have to say, in the majority of times when we call the owner, they're like, extract the tooth in. I get it. I mean, that, that's a fine, fine option. But try look at look at these M1s and M and uh, second molars and check for sticky spots or stained areas. Definitely. All three of these cases that I presented are examples of cases that are in our book. So as member clinics, we got this last year, but we have more available. Um, again, it's it's uncommon. We see them commonly, and I think. There, it's out there, and again, if you, if you do a lot of dental procedures, you're gonna, you're gonna see them. So they are available. If you want another copy, or if you didn't get a copy, um, $35 for members, and for non-members for the clinic, 70. So if you're here today and you want to purchase one, um, you can, if you're online, um, ping us, give, uh, give us an email. 100% of the proceeds, though, go to our Pets on the Man. But this is just, again, a really nice book with pictures to go through. One more PSA I have for you people. Learn to send your x-rays electronically, your dental x-rays. I'm not, I'm gonna show some examples and none of these are from referring veterinarians. These are things online that people send. So if you take a picture of the screen, 
as Dr. Feeney says, due to the limitations of the images provided, it's, it's really hard to evaluate. I am, especially if I'm getting glare and I'm seeing, or you know, I can see the person taking the photo, I can see their background. So learn how to do it. And there may be someone in your clinic who already knows how. What you need to do is ask them or call the, the software that you're using already for digital. Call the technical, write it down and post it, have it right there. We're living in the 21st century. We don't want to go back to lifting and holding up films. And, and you know, I, I've practiced long enough where I remember films and take a picture of film or sending films. We are doing electronic and learn to send them electronically. These just come up if you could do a stock search. The first one is called a serious surgeon looking at chest. <laughs> and, and the second, the second picture is pleasant doctor looking at series. And I have to say, you know, if you're going to a doctor that's holding up the film to the window, you need to run away. Right? <laughs> so learn to send your images electronically. Even if like I got an animal under anesthesia, resist taking out your phone and taking a picture of that screen. It's, it's easy to do, but learn how to do it. And don't have it that the one person who knows how to do it at your clinic, the day they're gone, everyone, you know. So put it on a post-it. Because remember, you guys can do 85% of all of dentistry. And this can be a major part of what you do in cases because of complete oral exam charting, along x-rays, dental cleaning, nerve blocks, extractions, biopsy. We went through some things really quickly, but we are here to help you. You have skills. You got this. And sometimes people ask, well, if I find something in the mouth, isn't it easier just to send the client to you and refer? We appreciate that. We love it. Um, but if you can work it up and do all this and then consult with us, maybe do the easy extractions, but now I have a tooth that the owner wants to do advanced things, or I'm not, or this is beyond what I feel comfortable doing, then send it to us. Because you actually are saving your client and patient time and money. It is, it is not less expensive to come to us. Um, and, and again, it's still an unknown. So to do the diagnostics, and I tell owners all the time, it's like, we're gonna, we're gonna do a fact-finding mission, and then we're gonna sit down and talk about the options. I don't like to do it while they're under anesthesia, that's not fair, um, but already plan that you don't have to feel the urge like, oh my God, I can't deal with this today on my schedule, then divide it up. Again, do the diagnosis, wake them up, talk about the next part. Your life will be better. And, and then you can talk calmly with, with the owners about what options are available, and you can talk to us. Did you find three things to do? Did you know three things? I hope you did. It may be, hey, you know, we're doing a pretty good job. Go back and tell your staff that. Or it might be, you know, maybe we want to consider this, or we need to have a conversation about some things. So if you follow the whole list, stick to only three. <laughs> really, don't, don't, don't overwhelm yourself. And if everything was like, you know, I knew all of this, this was just good review, then consider doing a residency and be a dental specialist. I'm not, I'm not joking. We need more people out there. So. Thank you. Um, online, if you have any questions, if you can type them in, I'm going to see if there's any questions here live. And so far, no one is raising their hand. So I need to put everyone to sleep. <laughs> Heidi's going to check. Yeah. We'll give it a few minutes. There is, I say, if we do. If we end up with hardly any questions, there's one little case that you want to go through at the very end. Um, that's kind of a yes. I just have a question. What's the etiology of curious in labs or golden uh, So the question was, what's the etiology of caries in, in labs or golden retrievers? It's dental caries, just like it is in humans. Mm -hmm. Honestly, it's not necessarily that on a bad diet or. Um, it's hard to say, but it seems like they tend to be overrepresented. Um, when I was a resident once, we, we saw one that was so big, there was a Lego stuck in it. I mean, you know, and I think partly these are dogs that they don't get periodontal disease. So they're probably not coming in as often as say our little breeds that we already know. They need to come in, we need to, we need to start doing dental cleaning. So, and they are happy dogs. 
you know, so they're really good at hiding it. But the etiology is actually the same as it is for human caries. So it is true caries per mouth. Good question. We have two questions online. Do you want to read this aloud? Okay. Um, this question is, if an owner is really motivated to save teeth, is it not possible to save those teeth in juvenile stomatitis case? Um, so that's for the young cats that have um, inflammation. To save teeth, well, I have to say, again, if we already have attachment loss of gingival recession, and gingival recession, gum does not recede and leave bone exposed. So if gum recedes, bone is also receded. So if I'm periodontal probing, you're also finding pockets or loss. You will never get that tissue back. You won't. In people, they're doing advanced periodontal therapy with flaps and membranes and bone. So, no. Um, however, you want to talk to them about, we're going to remove the painful disease teeth, and then we're going to concentrate on the healthy teeth that are there so we can get them through to three or four years of age and their immune system kind of uh, settles down, and then they go on to be normal, normal cats. Don't ignore it though, because the inflammation can cause them to lose all their teeth by the time they're three. So, great question. Pain meds for cats. Pain meds, pain meds for cats. Uh, lots of pain meds. Um, so, cats. Uh, pain meds, it would be learn how to do nerve blocks and know how to do a maxillary and mandibular nerve blocks. We use bupivacaine. We also add a little bit of buprenorphine, which extends the duration. And we're getting about 20 to 30 hours. So that helps you during the procedure and during recovery. And again, I'm old enough where I used to be in practice before we knew about nerve blocks. Most cats are painful. But afterward, I love um, uh, Simbadol, long acting, uh, the 24 acting. I, I really don't have any experience with the long, the 72 hour um, long acting buprenorphine. We use transmucosal buprenorphine for some of these cats. Again, if we're looking at stomatitis, um, fentanyl transdermal patches, gabapentin. Gabapentin is great. Um, you can have it compounded or just the capsules. You can open it up, put it in their food. It's a very rare cat that won't eat canned food with, a, with gabapentin in it. So we have lots of things in our toolboxes. And again, that's for mostly post-operatively, post-extraction, but you want these cats feeling pain-free while you're starting home care too. Um, one question is, what are we accomplishing with nerve blocks in these cases? Um, well, if you're biopsying, you want to, you want, that's painful procedure. If you are doing extractions, again, it, it really helps lower how much general anesthesia they need, provides pain relief. My goal is when they wake up, they have no idea what's happening in their mouth. They want to eat and sleep. And we have videos of cats eating within 20 minutes. Bone pain is that pain that at the end of the day, when everything settles down, it's that throb that keeps you up. So animals that are restless, that are vocal, they, they may act perfectly normal. They're still going to eat, but we, it's our duty to provide pain relief. So, and, if you're, and if you're doing um, even deep curatage, that's painful too. Um, question, what are you using for pain control and daily routine in juvenile stomatitis? So pain control uh, post-operatively is three to five days of some buprenorphine, um, gabapentin, and, and then I, I don't have them start brushing until about a week or two later. And we use Oravet, the professional um, plaque sealant that gets applied, it looks like wax in your car. So it's protecting the teeth from the plaque during that two week period until the extractions heal. If there aren't any extractions, we're gonna wait uh, probably about three, four days, have them come in, we're gonna start doing home care of whether it's wiping or brushing, but it is a step-by-step -step process. You're not gonna immediately get in there and start brushing this cat's teeth. You're gonna get them used to a week of once a day petting their lips. And if they're pain-free, they're like, oh, my mouth doesn't hurt anymore. And then it's starting to lift their lips. That is one thing home care I think we fail at because we know how to pill an animal, how to pill a cat, how to give an injection. We do it all the time. So it's very easy for us to demonstrate it to owners. But if we are not home brushing our pet's teeth, I think, it, I think that's a little bit of the barrier of how we teach someone else to do that. So I think, you know, we have some examination of ourselves. Sometimes though, we do have animals that are uncooperative no matter what we do for medication. And it, then it means telling the owners, 
if home care can't be accomplished, we're gonna to need to see them more often, we're gonna do more extractions earlier. And then one more question here. Mm -hmm. And in dogs with uh, gingival and bony recession with no signs of periodontal disease or periapical disease, do you still remove these teeth? So um, frequent cohad and home care are not sufficient. So again, gingival and bony recession, that's perio. Perio means around the tooth. That's we're losing attachment. Um, tooth root abscess is an endo. So again, you can get, you get such bad periodontal disease that we have already have a tooth root abscess, but those are two separate things. So yes, we need to treat the periodontal disease. Um, if you see a tooth that has periodontal disease, attachment loss, and also has a tooth root abscess, that tooth now has two major problems. The prognosis is much, much worse, because that'll mean a root canal plus perio. The chances of success are much lower, even with diligent home care. So. And do juvenile stomatitis cases show other immune system disorders? Um, that's a really good question. And again, with research uh, and studies, that would be helpful. You know, I don't see that they have um, increased globulins or increased, increased proteins. I think these actually are intense cases of severe periodontal disease. We throw in the stomatitis, but you know, these cats do not have lesions in the back of their mouth. They really do look different than the adult stomatitis cats. So in, from what I know, um, I don't see any other immune system disorders. Could they? Yeah, there could be some that do, but um, generally they're otherwise healthy cats with really stinky mouths. And the other reason too to evaluate it, remember the mouth is the beginning of a big long tube. So a stinky mouth, we wanna rule out that there's not dental disease going on, but there could be again, other GI things that, that are coming up through the mouth. So that's it on that. Did that prompt any questions for any other? Here? Yes. You said nothing about antibiotics, so I'm going to guess you use those very frequently, or when you do, when, and then laser therapy after you did dental work. Do you guys do that? Okay. So the question was antibiotics. I didn't mention anything about antibiotics. Um, and and when do I use them if I do? And then the, also about laser. So make sure I answer all of these. Um, no, I do not use antibiotics. And the reason is, and I think. One, it's this is a disease of inflammation, periodontal disease. The bacteria comes in afterward as opportunistic. And in today's day and age, we really have to justify why we are using antibiotics. Because one, we're getting resistant bugs. And if your pet has a resistant bug, you as the owner is very much at risk for, for getting a resistant. Um, also, by cleaning out the, the, the area, by treating the inflammation, that, that takes care of it. So when do I use antibiotics? If I have an immune compromised animal, a diabetic or some other immune that they cannot fight it on their own, their immune system. Because we get a transient, or animals, everyone, when we, when we eat, we get a transient bacteremia. And it resolves within 20 minutes. So the other thing too is, I know convenia is convenient. However, once it's in, we can't take it back. So if there's a reaction or, are we feeding bugs that could become resistant? So I, I really, it's very rare that we use antibiotics. Uh, now maybe a, a trauma or a bite, that, that, that would be another, um, another reason as why we would. And your last part was the laser. Um, we currently do not, however, we do have a rehab department and um, we're expanding into acupuncture now too. So I think that is, those are all valid things to do. Uh, we, we currently in our service do not, personally do it in the dental service. But um, again, this periodontal disease, itis, is, is inflammatory. So if, again, when we're looking at these dogs and cats, if we're looking at fatty acid supplement or um, uh, NSAIDs, treating the inflammation, along, again, along with removing diseased teeth is, is really key. Good question. Thank you so much. And again, we really appreciate everyone who came and thank you to everyone who is online. We really appreciate it. Have a good day. <laughs>